April 9th, Norway invaded. The battle of the continent becomes Europe's total war. One month later, Holland falls. Beloved Queen Wilhelmina seeks refuge abroad. Millions of Belgians reenact the tragic migration of 1914. May 28th, Leopold, King of the Belgians, surrenders, and the world despairs. Dunkirk, here 300,000 Allied soldiers battle and swim to safety under an inferno of fire. June 5th, the critical Battle of France begins. For three terrifying weeks, the armies of Begun fall back in the face of overwhelming mechanized might. Italy, while France fights for its life, Italy marches beside Germany. Six weeks after Holland and Belgium were crushed, tragic history is enacted at Compagnia. The image of General Foch watches as another conqueror arrives. He boards the same railroad car where Foch himself gave the armistice terms to the defeated Germany of 1918. These Nazi officials come with different emotions than those other Germans 22 years before. This time, French plenipotentiaries seeking terms instead of giving them arrive to learn the fate of their republic. Grim formality when victor and vanquished meet. With terms stated, Adolf Hitler allows time for the French to telephone the Vichy government. Solemnly, silently, the French delegates follow for conference with the man who became Premier of France only six days before. Henri Patin, who must give the answer. Weighted hearts return to the historic car bearing their fateful message. France has decided and the knee is bowed in submission with the flourish of tragic pens. War spreads eastward. Britain's fleet blasts the port of Purpura in Somaliland. Alertness. Strength. Courage. The heroic RAF takes to the air. Another German plane meets its master. Convoyed merchantmen brave constant danger from the skies. Each ship becomes a target for the raider's bomb. Each ship is set on getting supplies safely to Englishmen, to Welshmen, to Scots, to all ashore. Under brave General de Gaulle, pray Frenchmen still fight Germany. London, waves of Nazi planes swarm westward to the world's largest city. Some reach London's warehouses, tenements, and great docks. Londoners take to shelter, unafraid. Old and young, their spirit undismayed.
of their head, destruction is falling from the blacked out heavens. Artillery and bomb pandemonium rages for hours, days, and months. London burns by night. But daylight finds undaunted grit and confidence as the job of digging out proceeds. Even the dummies get attention. Uh, we mean dummy. Buckingham Palace, symbol of empire, residence of Britain's monarchs, does not escape the Nazi reign of steel. King George and Queen Elizabeth examine a piece of the missile that demolished a part of their palace home. St. Paul's Cathedral, where royalty and commoner worship also suffer. A bomb pierces the roof, destroys an altar, but spares other treasured monuments. The heroic RAF takes an ever-increasing toll. Nazi planes have fallen on English soil by the thousands. May well be that the final extinction of a baleful domination will pave the way to a broader solidarity of all the men in all the lands than we could ever have planned if we had not marched together through the fire. <laughs> Aid to Britain, short of war. In exchange for Atlantic naval bases in English possessions, 50 discarded World War destroyers are reconditioned. At a Canadian port, Americans transfer the sorely needed warcraft. Millions for artillery. Million for tanks and anti-tank guns. Million for airplanes, thousands of them, while American plants are producing other thousands for Britain. American Army airmen were the first to experiment with parachutes for war years before Russia and Germany made use of them in actual conflict. As Japan casts its lot with the Axis powers, the United States speeds the building of its first two ocean navies. With the stroke of a pen, President Roosevelt sets in motion the nation's machinery for drafting all men between the ages of 21 and 35. October 16th, on this day, millions of American youth in every corner of the nation register for military service. History repeats itself. A World War drama is reenacted, the same fishbowl from which capsules were drawn for the wartime draft in 1917 again serves for the country's first peacetime call. America throbs to the beat of the most startling presidential campaign in many decades. Wendell Wilkie arouses amazing devotion and respect in his strenuous bid for the White House. President Roosevelt also is given thunderous receptions. For the first time in history, a president of the United States is re-elected for a third term. <laughs>